Hi, I'm Sissy Graham Lynch. Welcome to Fearless, helping you have a fearless faith in a compromising culture. Over the last couple of years, we've seen our culture continuously grow in hostility towards Christians and our religious freedom here in the United States. And religious liberty is a bedrock to our values here in America. And we've been given this precious freedom to live out our faith freely, not just in the four walls of our home or our church, but in the public square and in our businesses and every aspect of life. And sadly, it's one I believe that we as Christians, we've taken for granted for so long. And I want Christians to know why religious liberty matters. And I want you to know some of the legal cases that are happening currently in our country and how our religious liberty is being threatened and what we can do to protect it. And one organization who is on the front lines fighting for you and fighting for me every day is Alliance Defending Freedom, which through the episode I'm going to refer to as ADF just for short. And today I have Kristen Wagner, who serves as General Counsel with Alliance Defending Freedom, joining me to share about the critical work of the Alliance. And she has argued before the U.S. Supreme Court, and she's won, and she has incredible courage, which is greatly needed. And Kristen, thank you for joining me today. I know you are so busy, but thank you. Well, thank you. It's a privilege to be here. And first, I just have to say my dad, uh, Franklin, our leadership at Samaritan's Purse and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, we are so grateful for all the hard work you do fighting for us and fighting for our faith on the front lines every day. So thank you. Well, I appreciate you saying that, but we've just been so blessed by Samaritan's Purse and Franklin Graham and just the vital work that your organizations are doing. Um, We had the privilege of getting to represent Samaritan's Purse during the COVID crisis, And I was just so impressed with the incredible work of loving our neighbor and making sure that in that process, we're witnessing and and really talking about the gospel in an unhindered way. So many times at ADF, you know, we're focused on how do you, how do you express a message about freedom to someone who isn't a believer? And sometimes that can make us have a spirit of timidity. And one of the things that I loved about Samaritan's Purse and and Franklin Graham during that process was just seeing him share about the gospel without a spirit of, inti- of intimidation or embarrassment, but just, just the beauty of the whole gospel. So it's really inspiring for me. Well, and I can say the same about Alliance Defending Freedom. And when I got to know them at the first time, just your excellence. But through it all is how can we Christians live this out? And we're going to talk about some of that amazing work of Alliance Defending Freedom. But for those who are listening— Uh, Many of you might have never heard of ADF, and so could you just share what ADF is and what you do? Sure. Well, Alliance Defending Freedom is the world's largest legal organization that is committed to protecting religious freedom, freedom of speech, parental rights, and the sanctity of life and marriage. And we do that in a number of different ways. We do it through training. We do it through funding. Um, We also work in the areas of Uh, legislative advocacy, so both at Congress and in state legislatures, in the public advocacy realm in terms of advocating for these principles in the public square, and then also probably what we're most well known for is our work in courtrooms across the country and at the U.S. Supreme Court. We've had the privilege of winning with uh, God's help 13 cases in just the last decade at the U.S. Supreme Court and The best part of what we do is just helping Christians who call us and just say, I don't know what to do here. I'm feeling like I don't have the right to live out my faith. Can you help me? And um, there are amazing stories I could tell you about that, too. And I love that you said winning. And I love on the website of ADF, it's like, we don't just represent, we win. And you do. You do it with excellence. But first, before we get into some of these cases, I want to talk about our First Amendment and our rights in the First Amendment, because I think Christians have adopted kind of this worldview of what the world has told us um, that the First Amendment is. How are our First Amendment rights, how are they so unique? Well, they're unique in that there are very few countries that have the same type of rights that we do and certainly not as broad or robust as we have. And it's because our founders had the wisdom to know that these rights that are contained in the First Amendment, they're not rights that the government gives us. They're rights that are inalienable. And we've heard that term a lot, but I don't know that we've thought enough about what it means, because that concept of inalienability means that 
These rights don't come from the government. They don't come from a state official, which means that that state official doesn't have the right to take them away either. Um, they are inherent in our human dignity in the fact that God has created us um, and that we have responsibilities to him and that there are things that the government can't interfere with. Um, when we have, let's say, the freedom of speech impaired, that means that we don't have the unfettered right to pursue truth, to debate ideas, and that the government can then tell us what those ideas are and that we have to live consistent with them. And that's very dangerous. I would also suggest that if you look around the world, and um, we talked, we opened with the work that Samaritan's Purse does around the world, and so I know you're very familiar with other countries that don't have these freedoms and and what that looks like. They have more war, they have more violence, they have more poverty. And frequently I will say to those who say, well, I, I'm not a believer, I'm not a Christian, I don't care about religious freedom, it's good to remind them well, I'm sure there are other freedoms that you do care about. And let me tell you why religious freedom is important to you. Because in those other countries, you don't have the freedom of speech. You don't have um, the right of the media, uh, free press. You don't have economic freedom. And frankly, the vulnerable populations are treated poorly, women and children and the disabled. Um, we can, again, look around the world to see what happens when we don't steward the freedoms that we have. Mm hmm and I so often, you know, I'll hear Christians use the excuse that that don't want to get involved and fight for religious liberty, and they just say, "Well, we see other countries, and when their religious freedoms taken away, that Christianity it really does um, flourish." And they use that kind of the umbrella to kind of hide behind or hide under, and they've never realized the light that. America is to the world, the hope we give to Christians around the world who have been persecuted. And that's what I remind people, if if that right is taken away here in the United States, what kind of hope does that give to people around the world? Oh, I so agree with you, and, and glad to hear you say that. I, I read something, um, it was years ago, but it really struck home for me, you know, because I've heard that same thing, even from ministers who would say, well, the church thrives in persecution. Well, uh, that might be, but I guess it's how you measure it, I think, in the sense of if you were to go to China or North Korea, if you were to go to a Muslim country that didn't have religious freedom, do you think that those people, that those Christians there would say, we love it here, you can continue to take away our freedoms? Um, they, they wouldn't. And we know that it's best for the gospel to go unhindered. God can work miracles, but he can do that with our freedoms intact, too. Um, so I, I'm really glad to hear you say that, because I think it's also about human flourishing, um, you know, facing persecution, losing loved ones, all those things that come at issue when you lose freedom and, and there's a government that is engaged in tyranny is nothing that we should ever hope for for ourselves or for anyone else. What, um, when we're looking at some of these legal cases that you represent and we're looking at some of the challenges we face in the last couple of years, is there... Um, some challenges on the horizon. What do you think would be the greatest legal challenge that we might face on the horizon that would hinder our religious liberty? Well, I'd first say, I think that the, the challenges that we're seeing in the culture are similar to the challenges we're seeing in the law. So um, there's no longer, it's no longer comfortable to embrace the name of Christ and to live out our faith in any, I think in any Square, whether that be in the public square, in the public schools, in our workplaces, and anywhere. And we're, we're seeing that play out in the law as well. We're seeing activists weaponize the law, weaponize the justice system to target those who have traditional or orthodox beliefs. And that primarily plays out in the areas of human sexuality. Um, so if you think about those who believe that marriage is between a man and a woman and simply seek to live consistent with that those who believe that God created male and female and that those biological differences matter and that they can't be changed. Um, that is really, I think, the primary area where we're, we're seeing a full court press to purge people that share those beliefs from the public square. And it, it started out with, you know, small business owners, artists, professionals who were creating custom expression um, in the marriage context and declining to do same-sex weddings, but it has quickly transitioned into all kinds of other fields where counselors, healthcare providers are forced to violate their conscience. Public school teachers are told that they can't serve in the system. Uh, parents are being declined the right to be able to adopt or to, to engage in foster care. And there's just a 
host of different areas that this is playing out in, and no one will be immune from it in the end, which is why it's so important that we articulate these clear principles that promote human flourishing and that are based on scriptural principles. And that's what I tell people. It doesn't matter what corner of the world you're in or in your little home of surviving the day, cancel culture, these legal issues, they will find you eventually because they're coming after um, Christians. But recently, ADF did win a case in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, I've spent a lot of my life in Alaska. We've spent our summer since I was eight years old in Alaska, so I followed the, this one closely. But protecting women and religious freedom at the same time. Can you tell us a little bit of that backstory and what happened? Sure. I, I think that this case is so important in terms of just understanding the lengths to which activists will go um, to impose an ideology. Um, I want to start out by talking about the theory behind it. Um, we talked about the justice system being weaponized and uh, those who hold these orthodox beliefs being targeted. And that's what happened in downtown Hope Center. And it happens through um, what are called non-discrimination laws, but they adopt categories called sexual orientation and gender identity. And while that sounds good, the way that it's playing out is to punish people um, like the downtown Hope Center, which is a faith-based homeless shelter, they provide about 450 to 600 cups of soup a day, um, job skills, training, they provide clothing, laundry services, all kinds of things to men and women during the day in Anchorage. But at night, they turn into a shelter for women. Um, and those women are predominantly suffering from uh, abuse, domestic violence. Also, they're trying to escape sex trafficking um, and, and a lot of drug and alcohol use as well. So they need a safe place on those cold Anchorage nights. Um, they also sleep in the same room at night, and that's important because of the way this case played out. So there's a large room and their cots are anywhere from three to five feet away from each other in a large common room, and there's 50 to 60 women a night that, that share that space. In 2018, in January of 2018, a man dressed in a woman's nightgown came to the shelter and demanded entrance. He was visibly drunk and injured. Um, the shelter's executive director, Sherry Laurie, came to the door and she offered to help the man, um, gave him cab money to seek treatment for his injuries. She prayed with him, talked with him, uh, but she didn't admit him to the shelter. And later, you can imagine how surprised she was when she received notice from the Anchorage Human Rights Commission that they were investigating her for violating the law because she didn't allow a biological man to sleep next to those vulnerable women. So long story short, that case proceeded. I know I, I mentioned 2018 because I think it's important for people to understand how long these things take and, and how hard they are on the organizations, the burden that it takes to weather this kind of storm, um, but also to see God's goodness in the end. So in the end, um, we had the privilege of representing Downtown Hope Center um, and argued to the court that the differences between men and women um, are important. When those differences are legitimate, they need to be recognized. And thankfully, um, after a federal court victory, the Anchorage Commission backed down. But that's not the end of the story. And I, I know I'm going on, but um, in 2021, um, they had to fight another battle with this commission because they tried to do an end run around the federal court system, which is why I mentioned that these, these people are being targeted uh, thankfully, once again, though, in December, we won another mo motion and the court said that they could not apply the amended ordinance to the, the Hope Center. But we are facing this issue about ignoring the differences between men and women across the nation and really around the world. And it's important that we stand, um, stand for these biological differences because it's especially women and girls who get hurt. ADF, you are in for the long haul. And you walk beside people like Baronel Stutzman for years and years, um, and Jack Phillips for years. You know, even after a victory in the Supreme Court, he still has legal battle because he is being targeted by that community. And so I'm so thankful for ADF and you being in for the long haul and coming alongside these people who were just trying to serve. This woman thought she was helping this man and serving. And so I am thankful, and to God be the glory for the victory. Um, there. And as we're talking about gender identity ideology, um, of course, that came up again um, when you're defending the PE teacher, Tana Cross, 
and Loudoun County. And now this year, everybody knows where Loudoun County, Virginia is. It has become the ground zero for so many uh, issues. But in this case, ADF helped preserve the speech and religious freedom of a teacher. Can you tell us a little bit um, about that story? I can. Um, And the Tanner Cross case is even, I think, a part of the issues we're fighting in downtown Hope Center in the in the Alaska case because they're really focused on this concept of of critical theory. Um, And and critical theory is a theory that there are oppressors and that there are victims and that everything should be viewed through that lens. So um, you can see it play out in the context of race. We've heard it there too, but we've also seen it play out in gender identity. And that's what's at issue in Tanner's case. Um, Tanner was an elementary school PE teacher, as you referenced, and he voiced his concerns about the Loudoun County Public Schools proposed policy um, about gender identity. And it wasn't a policy yet. It was something they were considering adopting that would require teachers to basically treat students as the opposite sex if that's what they requested. Um, And that would include things like denying, um, you know, biological women and girls uh, privacy in the restrooms. Um, It would require using the wrong pronoun that isn't consistent with someone's biological sex. It would require if a student said, I'm going to go by a different name, um, requiring these teachers to use use the different name and essentially treating them as if they could change their sex. So Tanner voiced his concern not only about the impairment that would have on his free speech rights, but also the harm that it would cause to children. Two days later, he was suspended from his job and was on the track to be terminated. Um, We went to court to get essentially an injunction to stop him from being terminated. The public school system doubled down, believe it or not, um, on their stance. And we took it all the way to the Virginia Supreme Court, where we were able to prevail um, on the issue before the court. And then the public school system agreed to enter a permanent injunction on Tanner's behalf. But I do want to point out um, that that case is continuing in terms of the challenge to the substance of the policy itself. So Tanner was protected and reinstated to his job, but that policy was adopted. And so there are still all of the the teachers and the school officials um, are being compelled to violate their First Amendment rights and harm children. So that case is um, right now in the court system as well. It is so important, these issues, because they're going to find us no matter where we are in life, no matter whether you're a baker, a PE coach, a florist, um, or a mom, and just a parent. And speaking of parents, once again, in Virginia, we saw mama bears come to, um, to rise up and start fighting for their children. And I think for me, when I look at the horizon and the challenges and the legal challenges that I, as a mom of two young children, might have concern over— Um, or just my parental rights. And I think that's a big concern for parents right now. And how is ADF involved in protecting parental rights and protecting our children? Well, both of our legislative team and our litigation team are acutely aware of the threat there and are focusing on it. Um, I would say it is probably the area that we are targeting the most right now. Um, And I, I think there are essentially three different kinds of threats that we can see um, that are already present. Um, One is the public school curriculum. Um, And I would say it's not even public school curriculum anymore. Many of the private schools are adopting this kind of curriculum. And um, I've even seen it in some Christian schools, uh, you know, that that don't realize what, what they're using in the secular textbooks and they're buying into these critical theories that are really harmful to kids and to our society. And they're in the public schools, they're indoctrinating kids Um, into this way of thinking um, that there are victims and oppressors and that you don't have free agency or free will. Um, And it's just extremely harmful to kids. So we have several cases um, that we're working on that are challenging that on behalf of teachers who are being compelled to teach this, um, as well as uh, parents and students who are, in some cases, a, a Virginia case we have right now, the students are not able to voice their dissent they are feeling the threat of punishment if they don't agree or go along with this curriculum. And the parents are left at a loss of saying, where do we go to educate our kids? Um, a second area is in medical decisions. And I think that affects all of us. Um, you know, if a, if a child expresses confusion in any way um, at the public school, there are many school districts now that are adopting policies 
that say the teacher can lie to the parents. They can actively deceive the parents and affirm a child um, that wants to be treated as the opposite sex and never let the parent know that this is going on at school. And we've actually had this play out. Um, there's also issues with transparency in curriculum. They're hiding the curriculum from the parents. So our legislative team is working on bills that ensure transparency in our educational system. Um, we also have it in terms of wanting to get counseling for, for our kids and those kinds of things. Um, and, and we're seeing states that are passing laws that basically say parents don't have the right to make decisions about the upbringing of their kids, including medical decisions. Um, so it's important that we stand on those. And, and lastly, I, I mentioned it earlier, we've even seen states that have said, if you hold orthodox beliefs about human sexuality, meaning there's male and female, um, or that you believe marriage is best between a man and a woman and, and that the Bible teaches that, you're ineligible to adopt or to uh, foster children. So there are a whole host of ways that parental rights are being attacked right now, and it's critical that we seize this moment and turn the challenge into an opportunity to make sure that parental rights are treated as fundamental rights in our Constitution. It's a, it is a scary world when we think the state knows better for our children uh, than we do. Um, ADF, you are in all the details, and I don't think people realize you're just not in the courtrooms. But when you come along a client, let's talk about Jack Phillips. I've gotten to know Jack over the last couple of years. This Samaritan's Purse has helped assist him. You know him very well, and you were step-by-step and guiding him and um, even teaching him how to speak into the media and how to answer questions. Well, y'all took the media on full force. You were even on The View, which that's just a scary place. That might be scarier than the Supreme Court. I don't know which one, in your opinion, was scarier or more nerve-wracking. Let me just ask you a personal question. What was that like? Because I have to ask, what was it like for you and Jack on The View? It was scary. I mean, I'm not going to sugarcoat it. You know, I know you're supposed to be like all cool about everything and ready to go, but um, I wasn't. Um, and neither was Jack. I, I think we went in. Well, actually, Jack didn't go in knowing what he was getting into because he's never seen The View. He never <laughs> watched it in advance. Um, but I, I knew. Um, and I can remember very clearly being on the plane, literally boarding the plane to go um, to do the interview and being on with our, our media person and saying, I don't feel good about this. I, I think maybe we shouldn't do it. Maybe this is just too much. And, you know, I just felt like the Holy Spirit in that moment kind of convicted me again about that spirit of timidity and and just saying this is an opportunity. And so we went on and we did a whole lot of praying and we did a whole lot of preparation um, to go on there. And and it was awesome. It really was to see, you know, we all have those moments and it doesn't have to be on the view. It can be at our dinner table with our kids where you're asked a question and you don't really, you're not sure if you're up to the answer, but the Holy Spirit comes and he provides that answer. And the, and the scripture promises us that that's what the Lord will do in our lives if we, if we give ourselves to him, if we step out and take those risks. And so the view is an example of that for me. And again, I'm going back to even what we started with, was being able to present the gospel. We didn't anticipate that that interview would really focus on the meaning of marriage and why it was important. Um, instead, we thought it would probably be about free speech and sort of more of the issues specifically in Jack's case. And yet, uh, again, there was that opportunity to say, this is what we believe and this is why we believe it. So um, it was a great experience. And it's so wonderful to have those opportunities to share the world his story, because so many times when you hear these people's story, you're hearing it one-sided. And to see that this is just a man who's used his God-given gifts to serve his community and um, to tell his whole story. But um, as you argued before the U.S. Supreme Court with courage and boldly, you know, our general counsel, he's often told me the story. He was in there praying for you. He was just like a nervous wreck praying all the way because he was uh, in the courtroom that day. Um, really briefly, because I know we could probably spend a whole day talking about Jack's case, briefly talk about what this case meant and what this did for religious freedom. Well, I think First of all, in terms of the case itself, um, remembering it's always important to, to go back to what actually happened because so many people don't have the facts. They think they know what happened, but that's not accurate. Um, Jack Phillips opened his shop, and for over 25 years, he sought to serve the Lord in every way. Um, he named it Masterpiece Cake Shop because he wanted to blend art and baking together, but also because he wanted to remind himself he couldn't serve two masters. 
we know the scripture in Matthew about that and 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 so many other scriptures that play into his worldview that when he goes to work, he doesn't leave his faith at home. So right when they opened the shop, Jack and Debbie, his wife, basically created um, some rules that they had for themselves that, that they would not violate their convictions in any of the custom cakes that they created. And so for years, they declined all kinds of different cakes that had messages that violated their convictions. And none of them had to do with sexuality. I mean, it might have been things that had to do with Halloween or divorce um, or anti-American cakes. They, they turned down all kinds of cakes. But in 2012, they were asked to design a cake that was custom, one of a kind, celebrating a same-sex ceremony. And it was that case, that cake, that landed them in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. I would say that the issue in that was it was really about whether um, he had the right, based on the First Amendment, free exercise of religion and free speech, to be able to live out his beliefs in his business. And it's also important to, to realize that as he was taking his case up through the court system, the Colorado Commission ruled against him, and they actually told him and compared his beliefs to slave owners, um, those held by slave owners and perpetrators of the Holocaust. They told him he didn't have the right to live out his beliefs in the public square. And they told um, other cake artists who supported same-sex marriage that they did not have to design custom cakes that had a message that were critical of same-sex marriage. So essentially, they had a double standard in Colorado. All of that matters because the Supreme Court based its ruling on those facts. And we won seven to two. The court only addressed the religious freedom arguments and said, that kind of hostility to Jack about his faith, the comparisons that it made, and the double standard violated the First Amendment. And so it, it limited its ruling in that way, and it didn't touch the free speech arguments. It was a tremendous victory for religious freedom and advanced religious freedom law, and has been cited over a thousand times in different legal publications and rulings. But I raised that issue because it left the free speech question open, and Jack was immediately targeted. Uh, the day that the court agreed to hear his case, by another individual, a transgender attorney, who asked him to design a custom cake that violated his religious beliefs about being a man or a woman. And when Jack declined that cake, that has now gone up through the court system, and Jack is still in court today. So we need the Supreme Court to make a ruling on the free speech side of things. And thankfully, right now, there is a petition before the U.S. Supreme Court giving them that opportunity. So we're hopeful that they'll take it. You know, you say that he's still in legal battle, and that just gave me chills, because when did this start for him? Give us the year. 2012. It's been a decade. Um, you know, and you mentioned Baronelle Stutzman. She's another one. Her journey just ended because, again, it started in 2012, and she's 77 years old. How long can you wait, you know, to, to have the court rule? It's, at some point, sh she's been denied justice, and the Supreme Court needs to take one of these cases to affirm free speech and the free exercise of religion. And for those who are not aware, Baronelle's story is very similar to Jack Phillips. She has spent her entire life and her career being a florist and serving her community. And one day a couple came in and asked her to do the floral arrangements for their same-sex marriage. And she decided that that would be against her religious beliefs and didn't want to participate in the wedding. So she had declined doing the flower arrangements for their wedding. I just, I, I think what they have walked through, but they've walked through faithfully and they've never compromised the gospel. They have served with, still with joy and uh, life. And as Samaritan's Purse, we're just grateful that we have can come along and serve with them and help them and thankful for what you do. And Kristen, as we get ready to close, once again, I'm so grateful for you taking the time. But once again, why does religious liberty matter to the mom and dad who's just trying to survive the day, live their life. Why does this matter? Why is it so critical? Well, again, we want the gospel to go forth unfettered. And in order to be able to do that, we need religious freedom. Um, and I think the scripture is pretty clear. The two, two most important things we're called to do is to love God and to love our neighbor. Um, loving our neighbor means stewarding the freedoms that God has given us. Loving our neighbor means ensuring that we have the right to speak freely about the truth that the Bible gives us, and that if we don't have that right to speak freely, then those women that are in the downtown Hope Center, they're going to be victimized again. Those women are going to have to sleep next to a man who has a history of, of violence against women. They're not going to be able to heal. There's going to be 
kids that are confused about their gender that aren't going to get the counseling that they need. There's going to be parents that are going to send their kids to be indoctrinated in critical theory that is harmful for the rest of their lives and for generations. So loving our God and loving our neighbor means stewarding the freedoms that God has given us. He's put us here for such a time as this. And I know that sounds so, you know, trivial or redundant, but but it's true. We we are made for this time and this season, and God knew that we would be here. So I would just encourage people, um, you were placed in this nation, you were placed in your neighborhood, you were placed in your job to influence them. And part of that influence needs to be in protecting these freedoms and, and talking about what matters um, at our dinner tables, in the PTA rooms, and everywhere else. And, um, and then I just encourage them to you know, I think about the story in the Bible about Moses and Pharaoh, and you could have been discouraged about what was happening in that season, but all the while we knew God was working. And that's been the story of generations of the church, right? So I, I believe it's a story here too. We are called, and God does great things through his people. Um, and I'm, I'm just thrilled for what Samaritan's Purse has done, and the encouragement that you guys have provided to our clients has been phenomenal. I mean, I... Sorry. Seeing Jack and Baronelle go through what they have gone through, the emotional toll, the physical toll, the spiritual toll that it takes on them, and yet seeing God's faithfulness play out through his people, um, it's just incredibly inspiring. And people have come to know Christ through it. So, yes, God gives us challenges, but he uses us for his glory. So that's why we should stand for free exercise of religion, religious freedom, and free speech. Well, Kristen, thank you. And we're just so honored to partner with ADF um, and to support ADF in any way we can. And because it is Alliance, that's in your name. For those who want to partner, who want to support ADF, or even maybe receive some guidance and uh, help from ADF, how can they do that? They can go to ADFlegal.org. Um, so again, it's ADFlegal.org. And as you said, we're Alliance Building. We have a church and ministry alliance, so we help lots of religious organizations as well as individuals. Um, so our phone number is at that website, or you can contact us through the website. Well, Kristen, thank you just for being an example of courage, which is greatly needed in the world that we are in today. And thank you for being on the front lines of religious freedom. Thank you. What a powerful episode with Kristen. All of these topics that we have talked about are so important, and I'm so thankful to have heard her heart and her hope and the joy that she has of why we as Christians need to stand for religious liberty here in this country. If you want to get caught up with some of the latest episodes of Fearless, I encourage you to check out sissygramlynch.com. And as always, I want to encourage you to follow me on social media on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And I hope and I pray that here on Fearless, I'm always helping you to have a fearless faith and a compromising culture.